All right. We want to do. We do want to do some sharing today and um, this morning. And and I'd like to have um, those of you that are in the room that uh, are going to be sharing on this pro self thing. If you come up here six feet apart and maybe find a nice comfortable spot on the altar, which is always a good thing. You know, start from there. <clears throat> and. Uh, and basically what this sharing is about is that we believe that we are in a transition here at New Creation Fellowship, and we believe that that, that transition, uh, that it, it should bring all of you in with it, with us together. And um, so uh, it's a movement of the Lord. It's not just something Randy's doing. This is, I, I want you to hear from different people in relationship uh, to this uh, and what they're hearing and um, and we're just we're just introducing something but I believe that we're going to start um, having more uh, more and more sharing along these lines uh, in the future <clears throat> and um, so as, as a matter of fact I think it's so important that uh, we probably will, uh, set aside our regular speakers on Sunday morning and have those who are being deeply impressed with this thing that God is saying. It always reminds me of the, uh, when I think about what he's doing right now, the time when Jesus had come and then he weeps over Jerusalem and he says, I would have gathered you, but you missed the time of your visitation. Well, I don't want to miss that time. And uh, I, not only that, but I want to promote what he wants to promote at this time. <clears throat> and basically, and you, we, they'll give you a little more explanation, but basically um, there is this the, a term that we've come up with and it's called pro-self and, and, and that's meaning exalting self, being about self, always thinking of self. And so um, I'm gonna let uh, Mallory come up here and each person's gonna share for about 10 minutes um, and I'm going to let her come up and just sort of give you a basic overview of, of what's being said and seen. Okay? Valerie? Good morning. Um, for those of you who... Um, are in the Denton area and actually come to church or you know, from ge this geographical area and attend this fellowship. Um, on November 10th, Scott and Amy and I sent out an email to everybody with a short publication on the Pro Self Spirit. And so um, <clears throat> that came from something that we had been working on um, uh, from a sharing that we had heard and um, felt like we were so deeply struck with what the Lord had released that we felt it was not only for us, though we were on our faces, but that it was for our entire local fellowship. And so we asked if um, Randy and Jim, if we could send that out. And they said yes. So what I'm going to be sharing from today is actually from that email. And I would um, humbly ask that you consider going through that again or prayerfully going through that again after today. I think it will help lay groundwork and make things clearer for you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be drawing from that primarily just to lay a groundwork and kind of pave the way for what other people would like to share uh, from the Lord. Um, <clears throat> so the pro-self spirit, what is that? Well, um, it all goes back to the devil or Lucifer originally um, and what, who, what, who we think he is. We think of the devil primarily as anti-Christ. He's evil. He's bad. He's ugly. He's against the Lord. He hates Jesus. He crucified the Lord. And we know that we aren't against the Lord, and we love the Lord, so we know we're okay. We have nothing to do with the devil. The devil is evil, and we're with the Lord. <clears throat> but what has been presented and what is the Lord is dealing with us on is, what if being antichrist is not the main thing that the devil is? What if that's secondary? That the core thing that drives the enemy is being pro-self. And... Um, and just hating Jesus is a reaction, uh, an, a secondary working of pro-self, and he only became anti-Christ when God took him out of exaltation. He was so pro-self that as long as he could have what he wanted and look good and be 
in the inner circle in heaven and be all about what God was doing, he looked fine. He looked just fine. But the minute the Lord crossed that pro-self spirit and he was cast out of heaven, he became anti-Christ. And um, <clears throat> that's, what, that's where the Lord has been dealing with me and the rest of us. So to set everything up for everybody else, I would like to read um, some passages of scripture that will have some points here that will clarify this further. So I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 9 through 17. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy veals. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? And so um, there are three things I'd like to bring out for us today. Uh, first of all, um, this I will, I will ascend, I will go up, I will be high. Um, the pro-self spirit, for the sake of identification, is it feels like it should be higher than where it is right now. Um, it's always trying to be higher than others and then where it, and then, the, and it, then its own seat that it's been given. <clears throat> I will ascend is a spirit. <clears throat> it's a value system. It's an orientation and a way of proceeding, not a demon. Okay, it's a way of proceeding. And it's a way of proceeding in an orientation that may not be obvious at first. <clears throat> uh, that's the second point. The third point, well, no, that was all the first point. The second point is this spirit will not let his prisoners go. It keeps people in bondage in some form or fashion beneath it so it can appear higher to itself and to others. And so that might be overtly in using force or, or positions or authority to keep people down so that the person with the pro-self spirit can look better, or it can be just in the mind with self-justifications and keeping blame shifting to others. And it keeps people in bondage that way so it can stay high. And the third thing to see is God brings it down. God will move and God will bring it down. Okay, then the second passage is in Ezekiel 28. <clears throat> This is kind of long, but I'm just going to start in the middle of verse 12. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities and by the iniquity of thy traffic. And that's merchandise. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all of them that behold thee. So um, a few things to notice that Lucifer had all the things that Christians want. Min anointing, ministry, 
being in the inner circle close to the leadership, and being a part of what God is doing, and knowledge. He had it all. And God says, I have set thee so. God gave that to him. The second point is that he used everything that God gave him for merchandise. He used it as leverage to lift himself above other people. God said, I have anointed thee. The pro-self spirit says, I am anointed. The third thing I wanted you to point, to point out to you is that he defiles the sanctuaries. And we are the sanctuaries. And if we have this working in us, we are defiled. Finally, again, God brings this spirit down. God will move and he will take it down, and he will take down whoever is working by this spirit. And in this, I just realized this this morning as I was preparing, he does it by ashes. He does it by the ashes of the lamb. He brings it all down by the crucified lamb, and it's gonna take it all down, every last bit, and the only thing that's gonna be left is lamb's ashes. <clears throat> Finally, I just wanna read, um, and I'll be done, the conclusion of um, the email, the attachment that I had sent out to the local fellowship here. Believing that the devil is just bad because he doesn't like Jesus is giving us an excuse to be prideful or to be lifted up or to look down on people and say, I like Jesus, so I'm not antichrist. But that very spirit is the true meaning of what the Antichrist name should represent. It is anti the way the lamb is, the way he thinks, and the way he sees, and what his desires are. It is certainly Antichrist, but it is mainly that way because it is pro-self. Pray for New Creation Fellowship, that somehow we could get the enemy out that has been able to sneak in and live in God's territory. We have been in agreement without knowing we have been in agreement with the devil because he is a deceiver. Pray for our people to have a great hunger just to be with the Lamb Spirit in the way that he is that would fill us and drive us and begin to drive us together. And maybe we can see an end of allowing this kind of junk in us that we would want to stand for one another that we would lay down our lives one for another and that his joy would be in us and he could fulfill our joy by his selfless life. I just want to declare that I have been a chief offender in this area but, and I have been an imposter and claimed that I was of the Lord when I wasn't and I had the spirit functioning in me as a core value but I have broken with it and I want the Lord to continue to deal with me and take it down until it's gone and all that's only Jesus left and I apologize to this fellowship for the spirit that I have brought into the sanctuary it is vile and I want Jesus and I want the lamb in me to bring it to ashes and just let Jesus be the one that just fills the whole thing and so for whatever influence and responsibility I have born in that, I'm going to bear the responsibility of being a carrier of a lamb from this time forward. It's going to be Christ here as much as I know. So that's all. I've taken enough time and others will have other things to say, but please take this very seriously and ask the Lord to help show you this. So the Holy Spirit quickened to me to show you a contrast of that in the scripture because this, this pro-self, this self-exalting spirit <clears throat> is in contrast to Jesus and being a lamb, not just a lamb, a slaughtered lamb for others who don't deserve it. <clears throat> this is Ephesians uh, 2, 1, and it says, You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the originator of this spirit, <clears throat> um, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation or our manner of life and time passing the lusts of our flesh, meaning fulfilling whatever we wanted, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath as others, but God, and it starts going into the cross and him getting low, he becoming the least and in the lowest, lowest place that you could become, broke that spirit. And so, Scott, if you're on there, if you said you wanted to share something, feel free to share with, it, with us now. 
a few weeks ago, um, you know, the Lord started to speak to me out of a passage in Jeremiah. And I'm just going to read what uh, the Lord gave me uh, in the interest of time, since we have several of us sharing this morning. So uh, the passage is Jeremiah 730 um, through 32. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. And they have built uh, the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they, have, for they shall bury it in Tophet till there is no, till there be no place. And, um, you know, Mallory was talking about the the sanctuary and and defiling the sanctuary, and that's what this is speaking of. Um, we know that we're the temple of the Lord, but what abominations could we have brought into this house? You know, how have we polluted it? And and I want to say uh, first that the, this this was not something that I'm just sharing for you. The Lord is dealing deeply with me on these things. Um, and these questions are questions the Holy Spirit has spoken to my heart. But could this refer to the images that we have fashioned in our mind of who God is? Could it be that we have embraced an image of him that he finds to be an abomination? Maybe he might even call it the image of the beast, an image that is not selfless, but is pro-self. Tophet means smiting or contempt. Could it be that we have shown contempt for the true image of God, smiting the lamb through our embrace of these false images? We can look in the scriptures and think they don't really relate to us. We might think, I would never sacrifice my children to foreign gods. But do we put them in the fire of our wrong attitudes? Do we expose them to our grumblings and complainings about others in the body of Christ? But it's not only our children that we willingly sacrifice to these idols. Everyone we come in contact with, we put them in that furnace where they are exposed to all the garbage in us that is not Christ, that is pro-self, that is criticizing our brothers or sister, exalting ourselves above them. We grumble much like the Israelites did against Moses in Numbers 11.1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. When there have been children among these, there is nothing here that indicates that the fire was selective in whom it, it consumed. Weren't their children sacrificed to the altar of their wrong attitudes and their grumblings? We must understand that our idols, our false images of God, are not merely what we imagine in our mind. We think God is like this. Oh, he is beautiful because he gives me things that fulfill my flesh and make me happy. Obviously, we have wrong ideas of who God is. We all do, and that's part of the problem. But the real problem and our real idols are revealed in the way that we relate to God and to one another. This is where we see who we really think God is through our relationships. We live according to what we believe. Do we seek first his kingdom or our own? Who is really first? If Christ is not first, then he is just one of many. That's what happened to the, with Israel. It wasn't that they stopped worshiping God. It was that, they, that God merely became one of Israel's loves. Well, what has first place in us is what we truly worship. And if what we worship, if what has first place is us, there it is, that ugly pro-self spirit. Wait, that's like the spirit of Satan. Are we worshiping that? Are we going to our high places to worship like the Israelites because we don't like the low places where the Lamb of God likes to dwell? the high places of Tophet, of contempt, 
and smiting the lamb. The image that we worship is the image that we emulate. As a child, we might say, Daddy, I want to be like you. We say that, we say we, we want to be conformed to the image of Christ, but then we continually live contrary to it and don't even realize it because we don't truly know him. We have seen him in the scripture and allowed that to satisfy our soul when we are still the same idol-worshiping mess we always were. We may not make actual carved images or molten images, but we certainly create these images in our imagination. We imagine God in the image that we like or understand, or maybe how we have been taught instead of being with him and knowing him as he is. We see this tendency in Aaron's fashioning of the golden calf, most likely. This calf was no random choice. The Canaanite gods were typically portrayed riding bulls, which were a symbol of virility and strength. Their view of God was all about things they viewed as important. Does God have power, strength and power? Certainly he does. But is strength and power what he desires to define him? This is what throws us off. If we had that kind of power, we would continually use it for ourselves, for our own benefit. We would not lose for others, but gain, seek to gain for ourselves. The answer to that can be seen in Revelation 5, when we see who is seated on the throne. What is the image that we are given that God the Father wanted to enthrone? It's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what the... That's what the uh, person said there in that passage, the, the angel, the messenger. There, is, there it is, strength and power. But wait, when John turns, what does he see? He doesn't see a lion, which is clearly a symbol of power and strength, but a lamb. But John had to turn to see it. If he had not turned, he would, not, he would have continued to believe it was about strength and power. When the heart turns, the veil is rent. How many times have we heard that phrase without actually turning? When we actually respond to God's word. But we say, oh yes, the heart must turn. Well then, let your heart turn. If, if we don't turn in practical ways, we will miss the lamb. From the beginning, Israel missed God was a slaughtered lamb. This is why they missed Christ, because it would never have occurred to them that God would come in anything but strength, power, and success. It would never occur to us either, but he did. And God is trying to awaken us to our true state. We are in such great need of getting the real God, the real Jesus in us, in such a way that these idols, these, this image we emulate, the image of the beast, is shattered and our high places come down. Only a few kings of Judah tore down high places, tore down the high places. They saw them for what they really were. They were places where self was exalted above God, just like Satan. So when we join these kings, or we continue business as usual, if we do not hear the heart cry of the Lord at this time and tear down these high places, we may never know what we missed but we can be sure of this, we will never know the Lord in the way he intended, and we will continue to offer all of those who say, we say we love all around us to the fire of our wrong attitudes. They will be consumed right along with us. So ask yourself, are these idols you are holding onto worth that? Uh, at the end of the passage there in Jeremiah, it says, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no longer be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they shall bury in Tophet till there be no place. So we know that Tophet means smiting, and we have spoken about our smiting of him, but Christ was smitten for us. He was smitten by us, but also for us. And this valley is named after a foreign son, the son of Hinnom, and Christ, the true son, all of this is swallowed up. Christ swallowed up this son who was not of his kind or of his image. There this foreign son is put away and buried. So we see that Christ crucified is the answer to this dilemma. The valley of slaughter, of the slaughtered lamb. That's who is on the throne 
a slaughtered lamb. God says in this verse that this place will be put away. It will be swallowed up in him. But this is not a doctrine for us to learn. It is a lamb which we must eat. We must get this lamb in us. He is the good king who will bring down the high places and cast down our idols. When he becomes first, he will overturn the money chamber changers' tables in our hearts and cleanse this temple. I'm sure most of the <clears throat> ones who... Uh or sharing would, wouldn't would mind you uh, emailing them or texting and asking for a written transcript of what they've shared, if, if, if you have that. Because, <clears throat> um, you know, it's, it's a little bit long on some of these things and that would be, that would be good for you to be able to meditate on each line and things like that. Um, Let's go to Amy, um, and Amy, if you would just share with us what the Lord has uh, in your heart that he's given you. The Lord has really been working on me and um, just sharing himself with me. <clears throat> he said, I, he said the word Pharisee to me, not in a condemnation way, but as in a, hey, go check it out way. Um, so... Um, I started researching Pharisees, and um, a Pharisee knows the Lord. They're in the temple learning the word. They're ministering. They're um, lovers of the written word and the tradition of the law. Um, they're the upstanding citizens. Um, they're the righteous, you know, um, they're the ones that separate themselves. They separate themselves from all this outward uncleanliness. Um, and um, they, sep they, they would separate themselves from the unclean. And um, this, you know, in my mind, well, hey, that, that makes sense, you know, separating yourself and this may seem holy and good, but this too can feed the flesh um, and exalt itself. So now I'm starting to think, okay, I, I see a little bit more of a, the Pharisee's heart, where they're coming from. And it made me think, you know, how am I separating myself? Um, am I separating separating unto Christ or separating from others or other members of the body or what I think is um, holy and good. And that brings me to a mindset of thinking higher of myself than I ought. And, you know, as we've been talking about the ash heap, you know, let's remember Jesus is at the ash heap. That's like, I, I'm, um, that's outside the camp. That's where no one else wanted to be. Okay, that's my little setup here. But then he led me to um, Luke uh, 7, 36, 39. So we're talking about the Pharisees, right? So Luke 7, 36 says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he sat down to meet Oh my gosh, this Pharisee, he desires the Lord. He invited the Lord in. Come sit with me. Come eat with me. Come set up my table. Come be at the position of honor in my house. And this Pharisee, I mean, seems okay so far, right? But this heart... This high-minded, separated heart um, to the knowledge of good and evil is left. If it's left unchecked, un unguarded, uncircumcised, it will exalt, exalt itself. And we'll see that in a minute. <clears throat> but um, in verse 37, um, here we go. So, and behold, a woman 
in the city, which was a sinner, went. She knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Okay, wait a second. Who just came into my house? A sinner, this lady sinner, found her way into my house. And she is beelining right for Jesus. Hold up here. Um, I'm up here. She's down there. And who does she think she is coming into my house? This sinner. Remember, the Pharisees love to separate themselves. And the Pharisee is navigating this by the law and his desire for position and separation and making sure he's up here. He has all of his ducks in a row, you know, on the outside. Everything's happening on the outside, looking great. And even he has the desire, but he is violating his holy position by his outward doings, these outward things he's doing. Let's look um, at verse 38. Um, so this woman came in and she stood at the feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs on her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. So this woman, this sinful woman came straight in. All sights were set on Jesus. Everything was like worked past, got to get through straight to him. She drops right down at his feet, takes a position of lowliness in the dust on the floor immediately. So we see two different positions happening. One looks pretty darn good. One is um, vile to the Pharisee and the one of the law. And one is um, not desired. Um, but in verse 39, this is my point here. In verse 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself. This is a, a, a big clue for me. His heart, he was saying in his heart, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. So he's saying in his heart, he's casting this judgment and, and um, everything that she is coming in with her heart to do, the motivation of her heart coming in. He said in his heart, as all this transpires, okay, as she's coming in, and this tells me what is going on inside of this Pharisee, this one this, that he knows everything and he attends all the classes. It shows me the position of his heart and the self, this pro-self heart that separates itself above and, and pushes up above those that don't maybe look as good or, you know, that's the heart that we're seeing. And as she is a sinner unclean man she knows her position she's coming right in at his feet but she has she was single-minded for jesus and this kind of heart goes into him at the ash heap and the other kind the pharisee's heart that his kind of pro-self heart will never go outside the camp it will never take a position to go outside and find the Lord in the ash. And that's what the Lord showed me. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to share a, a little bit from Daniel in chapter eight. And um, it, it is uh, something the Lord spoke to me a year ago. Um, but last week I woke up and I was, I would say struggling with the pro-self spirit inside of me. And I knew that it was trying to take 
the lamb off the altar of my heart and was trying to move me to uh, proceed in a way that would control things and manipulate and lift me up. And, um, and I was struggling because I so deeply need to be cleansed from this spirit in me. And I'm declaring that before my brethren so, so the Lord can hear that. And as I was struggling, um, the, the Holy Spirit moved and, um, and he began to lift up the lamb in the mid, mid of the mire of that filthy, filthy pro-self spirit that is in me and was in me. He started lifting up the lamb and the lamb started coming, but he reminded me of this thing he shared a year earlier. And uh, this thing he shared had a math problem in it that was a, a riddle and a mystery. And he had never fully solved the math problem. But that morning, which was just a, about five days ago, he solved the math problem. And I felt like he wanted me to share very shortly the verses in the math problem with you all today. So in chapter 8 of Daniel, beginning in verse 4, it says, I saw a ram pushing, pushing westward and northward and southward so that not even a beast could stand before him. He will have his way. Neither was there any, not a one, that would deliver out of his hand. He was going to do according to his will, and in so doing, he became great. This is all that pro-self spirit controlling. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west over the face of the whole earth, touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river. And I ran unto him in the fury of his power. Verse 8, skip down to verse 8. Therefore the he-goat grew very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable horns, rising up to the four winds of heaven. And out of those four horns, notice just the increase and the pushing and the my will and ramming its way through. Out of one of those horns came a little horn, and that horn grew exceedingly great towards the south and the east in the pleasant land. And it grew so great even to the host of heaven and it began to cast down the host and of the stars to the ground and stamping upon them. And then he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. This motivation became so strong and would not yield and pushed its way forward so deep and exalted itself so high that it went right up to the throne of God and it started casting things down until it literally took the sacrifice off the altar and just stamped it out. No sacrifice, none. That's the motive that did that. And I heard it, verse 13, and I heard a saint. They're watching this, speaking to another saint, saying, how long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. How long shall the pro-self spirit triumph over the evening and morning sacrifice? How long? How long is this going to go on? How long will it prevail? Verse 14, and he said unto me, until 2,300 days, 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Okay, so we're going to look at some math here. But before we do, very quickly, God knows the exact amount of evening and morning sacrifices that will ascend for the rest of the days we are on earth. Each day, there will be an attack upon the burnt offering being released, and that attack is by the pro-self spirit that is in all of us. There is a day that the Antichrist pro-self spirit triumphed over and robbed God of his son. Every day that happens, every day the pro-self spirit 
pushes and rises and controls and manipulates and robs God of that uh, evening and morning sacrifice, that's the day the Father's robbed of his Son coming forth out of us in sacrifice. That's the day God's robbed of feasting on his firstborn through us because he cannot be released in sacrifice because of a pro-self spirit that has grown and gotten exceedingly strong in some areas of my life and maybe others. Maybe that's part of why we're here now. Let's look at the map. We've got 2,300 days. Thanks, Cassie. Thank you. So we've got 2,300 days that the pro-self spirit exalts and robs the altars of the evening and the morning sacrifice. Okay. So I had that since last year. The Lord said, I want to solve this math equation. I need to move in a little bit. I want to solve this math equation. And he said, there's going to be a number. And he told me five days ago that the number's 30. And I said, what, what, what do you mean? God doesn't usually speak to me in math, by the way, if you know me. <laughs> you do know this is God. <laughs> You know this is the Lord when I'm bringing a math to the table. Okay. Yes. So 30. I said, Lord, what is it with 30? And he said, 30. There's two 30s we're going to talk about. Number one, 30 is the year a man became a priest in Israel. When they were 30 years old, they were ready spiritually to offer up the lamb. And the other 30 is Judas, the one who sold off the sacrifice for 30 pieces of silver, a spirit that was just, um, when he saw Mary of Bethany, when Judas saw Mary of Bethany pouring over the lamb and, and wanting to enter into that ash spirit, he was so upset, he let Satan fill him. Judas let Satan fill him when he saw a priest like Mary of Bethany truly, truly releasing a lowly spirit. He let Satan fill him. That's the other 30. The Lord said, put 30 into 2,300, and this is what you get. I, I just welcome everybody to grab your, I know y'all are grabbing your calculators right now. I know you are, at least half of you. This is what should come up. 30 into 2,300 is 7.6. Oh, oh, thank you, Lindsay. I see, I'm really bad at math. That's right. I need Lindsay. I need everybody all day long. 7.6. Six, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You put 30 into 2,300, you get seven, six point six, 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 seven. How long is the, the pro self spirit going to keep robbing God of his son in the evening and morning sacrifices of our lives? Of our lives? until that spirit, that seven, represents that spirit of the slaughtered lamb filling us so deeply that we want to be priests that let the firstborn son go instead of our rights and our way and our will and our manipulation and our control and our pushiness and our risings. When that seven, when that slaughtered lamb spirit comes in, all the six, 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 six of that Judas, antichrist, self-loving, self-exalting spirit goes down. How long until this is done? Until that spirit triumphs over that 666. This, the mark of the beast that's inside of us that, that rises up against the lamb being offered. That's it. Well, I just want to um, agree that um, with those that have gone before me, that the Lord is speaking to me, not based on something I'm seeing in the word, but based on um, things that I'm seeing working in my own life. And, um, and just as Mallory and Kelly, you know, are saying these things are just popping up and all of a sudden you realize you are literally just allowing this pro self spirit to, um, take over. And sometimes it's a, in the name of the Lord, <laughs> it's this like self-righteous thing. And, um, I mean, it was happening to me even last night, and you know, the Lord gave me all this stuff to share, and then when I started realizing how many people were gonna be sharing, I was like, but I have all this to share, Lord. Why would you give me all this? And it was like all this stuff started to come up, and I was like, wow. 
wow, Cassie, even of the things of the Lord and trying to share, just lacking so much in realization of, of my spirit and way is what the Lord was just sharing. And so I am, I asked him to not have me share because I don't want to release anything yuck to you guys. But I am in agreement that what is being said is is true that there is this spirit it's not it's not a demon it is it is a spirit that we um operate in and we operate in it more than we realize uh, and it's happening around the clock and we just have not fully recognized it and and i believe the lord is calling all these here before you today to 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 herald to, to trumpet to sound the alarm that there is something that needs to be identified within each of us something that um it's not just like a principle but this truth this reality of of this thing that's in us that exalts itself that pushes and manipulates and works the situation to our advantage and um And I want the Lord, and I, I am thankful that he is identifying these things in me because I want them to be dealt with. And sometimes it's hard to hear such heavy things. It's like another, another sermon where we're yuck. Have we had enough of those? Can we get something a little more lighthearted? And I, I have that feeling sometimes, but I'm, my spirit is rejoicing because even though it's pointing out yuck within us, the point is to pointed out that it can be cleansed and removed and that Christ can can really come forth and and the beauty that comes from that um, is worth it it's worth it so um, I'm just going to share briefly from second chronicles chapter 28 and it's talking about King Ahaz he was the king of Judah and um, his father was King Jotham who was mighty it says he was mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. And then Ahaz's son was Hezekiah, who also followed in the ways of the Lord. But it says Ahaz did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. And, and so Ahaz is the main person that we're going to be speaking about. But he's surrounded by all these who are doing what's right in the sight of the Lord. But yet God's wanting to focus in on him. And sometimes the Lord is moving so powerfully in other people, we can kind of slide under the radar and not let the Lord deal with us. We can kind of hide and say that's not, that's not maybe applicable to me. But I'm here to say it is applicable to you. It is applicable to me. And that we need to hear this and that the Lord does not want us to slide and fly under the radar and not be seen and just let it be for, for certain people. It's, it is for all of us and it is all for all of us because it is for Christ's sake and the gospel. So in Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 24, it says, And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God and shut up the doors of the house of the Lord and he made for himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. You know, you have to kind of wonder, well, why would he do that? And the Lord just said to me, because... If you have the house of the Lord open and that's where the sacrifice in that way and that spirit is allowed, then it's higher than the king. And when you're the king, you want to be higher. When you're the boss, when you're in charge, when you're in control, you don't want something higher than you telling you how to run your life and what to do. And Ahaz was the king. And he did not want something to be higher than him. And he literally shut up the house of the Lord. He shut out the vessels. He shut out the way of sacrifice and of the lamb. He shut all of those things out and said, this, this is not for me. This is not, you know, it's, I'm not a priest. That's for those guys. This is not, this is not for me because this is going to infringe on my position. And I, I just felt like the Lord was saying that Ahaz was was guarding his position because he felt good about his place where the Lord had placed him, right, as king. And, 
And so I just was feeling that there is this unawareness of, of his lack for the Lord, so, so much so that he shut out the vessels. But when he shut the doors and he cut up and shut out the vessels and shut all these things out, the Lord was showing me that he was also shutting out the voice of the Lord into his own life. And how we shut out the voice of God through the vessels of the Lord. Be, may it be people who share the word with us or come before us with the word. We have a very strong, steady um, sharing of the word here. But we um, can start shutting out the, vessel, the vessels of God that are here and sharing the Lord with us. Because it makes our flesh uncomfortable. It does not always feel good. It does not always feel good. Some of the things that Randy delivers and things, I mean, it, it hurts. And so we feel that uncomfortable feeling in our flesh. And if you don't face it head on, you will shut the door on the Lord and on the spirit and way that he's saying, because it is a blow to your pride. It is a blow to our pride. If we are not up here and we are not looking good and if we are not over here and maybe you, that is us, man. We are manipulating every possible situation to get the outcome that we desire. And if somebody is sharing or preaching or the word is going forth or the Lord is speaking to us in regards to these things in our life and touching a place that we don't want touched, we shut the door. Just like Ahaz. Because we think we don't need it, or it doesn't apply to us all the time, or I'm not that bad, or because I have the Lord, and I, that would not be me. It is you, because it is me, and it is us. I'm going to back up in the story just a little bit before it said that in 24. Um, what's happening prior to that, that scripture that I just read in verse 24 is that King Ahaz, um, or Judah, is in trouble. They're being invaded, and, and so King Ahaz seen, sends to the king of Assyria to get help. And um, we read that the king of Assyria came to Ahaz and distressed him. It caused him trouble. He did not help him out. So he's in all this trouble, but Ahaz took a portion out of the house of the Lord to give to the king of Assyria to help him out. So he's using the things of God to further his own kingdom and calling it the Lord in that sense. So he's self-protecting. He's not turning to the Lord. He's turning to other kings. And in the process, as he takes away the portion, he gets no help. And before I move to the next portion of scripture there, in 2 Kings 17.33, it says, They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. They feared the Lord. I'm sure they loved the Lord. They heard his word. It bore witness to their spirit. They heard it, and they knew there was something right in the Lord. But they served their own gods. Even though they feared the Lord, even though they heard the clear voice of God, they, they served their own gods. And do you know who their own gods were? It was that pro-self spirit of, of being exalted and being above and doing still my way. Yes, this would be the way of the Lord, but oh, it just it, it really doesn't fit with what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to accomplish and where my life is going and how it fits or the way I'm going to look if I go with the Lord in this situation. I'm going to look really bad. I'm going to look like I don't have it together. I'm going to look like I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to be seen. They're not going to know that I'm the one who had that. How will they know that I'm the one who really shared that? And that other person mentioned it, and they don't even know that I'm the one who shared that. You know what I mean? These little things that come up. I'm the one who shared that first. Or da 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 All these little things that cut us out of the equation when we want to be cut in. 
That is fearing the Lord, yet serving our own God, serving this pro-self spirit and allowing that to prevail and to guide and manipulate and reorder our circumstances for the outcome that we desire. So back in Chronicles, This is right after it said that Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of the Lord and gave it to the kings, and then they didn't help him. Verse 22, and in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against the Lord? Because he was trying to turn everything to himself and make it about his prospering. He never was wanting to make it about the Lord. He wanted to make it about his kingdom prospering. I wrote down somewhere when somebody was talking, Scott, I think, seeking first the kingdom of God. Ahaz was seeking first his kingdom, not the kingdom of God. And we may not be a king, but guess what? We are seeking first our kingdom all the time. And that is causing us to trespass yet more against the Lord. And here's the key. This is, I'm going to finish up here. This is the key. The last five words of verse 22 says, This is that King Ahaz. This is that. This pro self spirit that we operate in daily is that King Ahaz that took a portion of the house of God and gave it to Assyria for help. This is that. This pro self spirit that tunes out leaders and others that God has placed in our life is that King Ahaz that gathered together the house of the Lord and cut them in pieces. This pro self spirit that has closed itself off to any embracing of the Lamb and of sacrifice is that King Ahaz that shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. This is that. And we don't see it for that. We see, we read accounts in the scriptures and we say, we would never do that. Or how could they, you know, we look at the children of Israel all the time. How could they be so stupid? God's already delivered them. Why are they freaking out? We see it in the word and we feel like we would never do that. And I'm telling you, the word of the Lord today said, this is that. This pro self spirit is that King Ahaz in you that is shutting off the Lord, closing the doors, and cutting up the vessels of the Lord. This is the spirit that works in us so strongly that we are completely unaware of. This, it is that. And we think it's not us, and it's always someone else. Because of thy rightness. <laughs> they feared the Lord, but sacrificed and served their own gods. Well, here's the good news, and that is that the Lord also showed Cassie the answer that she didn't share tonight. <clears throat> But, you know, when, when the Lord does that, when the Lord hits you, man, I mean, hits you uh, with <clears throat> what's wrong, guess what? He always comes back and hits you with how to get out of it. Right. You know, I mean, people go, well, all you ever share is, you know, bad stuff and stuff that's so hard and whatever. I, I share the easiest thing in the world. Christ Jesus is the answer, you know. And uh, so I have a, just an interesting little uh, thing here, and then we'll, we'll look at some videos. <clears throat> this is Jesus talking, and Jesus knows, knows that spirit. He knows that, yeah. you know. And he says, if Satan cast out Satan, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is divided against himself. Right. Why? Because he's pro-spirit, right? He's, he's divided. 
How then shall his kingdom? Well, see, he's building his kingdom. Pro self is built, not just building up himself, but his little kingdom, getting all this stuff around him, right? And so I wrote, he can only exalt himself and build his own kingdom. Pro self, that's all he can do. Uh, that's all this spirit will allow for. With pro self, it is impossible to receive correction unless but God. Can I read those scriptures that I read earlier now? Because it's so good. It's so good. It's, it was in Ephesians too. Wherein you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works, right now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our manner of life in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God. But God, there's, there's the answer. There's the door. It's like there's the door. Run for it. <laughs> Run for that door. And, it, and the but God is but God gave his son and died for the ungodly. Praise the Lord. So, you know, when, when some of these folks and others, others of you, when we, sh when we share, even if we don't get to that point, because how, how far could all these people get? They only had about 10 minutes apiece. But when they get to that point, you're going to find that there is hope. There's always hope. There's always hope. If you give up hope, which, well, there's always hope. Because there's always the Lord. All right, so you ready to believe? Yes. yes. Let's believe. Father, we just, we just thank you for the declarations of these folks. We thank you for their heart to break with things that are not you and that are not, not ordered of you. They're not of your spirit. They're of another spirit. That, and, and, it, and it works in now in the sons, the children of disobedience. Uh, who walk after their own pro-self and their own kingdom and their own uh, lust of the flesh, all the things that it describes there, but then you intervene, but God. And we, we receive those two words right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You, you ordered that scripture that way. <laughs> you didn't want to leave us in despair. You wanted us to know there was a door, a door of hope. Hallelujah, a door of faith. And we will be ministered that door more and more along the way here. Uh, but Father, how, how shall we run for that door if we don't know how badly we need it? So thank you for sharing and having these share the need. Thank you that 666 isn't going to just last forever. It's not, uh, you know, and through infinity and beyond. There's no beyond infinity, but anyway, <clears throat> we are with you. We love you. Uh, we got junk we really do want out, uh, not just because it's junk, but because it's the prince of the power of this world. And it's the opposite of your beautiful spirit. And so we'd just tell you, we love you just, just in the midst of the worship that we had today, just in the midst of the, of the special that we had today, just in the midst of the, the gathering that you've given us this, this year was, was in some ways more special than we could have ever imagined. And certainly in my heart, I am just so blessed. Father, I could just weep right now. And so we thank you as you, we march on with you together. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. How about, and everybody said? Amen. Because, see, they wanted to hear. <laughs> they wanted to hear that. <laughs>
Let's pray. Father, we just love you and we love one another and we thank you for your spirit and we thank you that it's not about us and everybody loving us, but loving one another. Thank you for this wonderful gathering where we could exalt your son above our wants, our needs, our, our traditions, everything, Lord, and be together to just lift up Christ, to exalt him above ourselves and above everything else. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, bless this coming year. Bless it with your presence and your dealings. And may we have a most wonderful time, Father, growing together in your Son. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Yeah. Woo. Wave well, goodbye. Goodbye. We got. We got nobody to turn it off, so goodbye.